chapter 3. The story is in Genesis chapter 28 concerning Jacob's vow to God. First, I want to show the contradiction Dr. Kelly makes between chapter 2 and chapter 3. First from chapter 3, quote, Like Abraham, Jacob was surrounded by pagan Canaanite priest kings. If he gave a tithe to them, he would actually be promoting idolatry, child sacrifices, sex with animals, and worship slash prostitution, end quote. Yet in chapter 2, Dr. Kelly states, quote, Genesis 14 is a discussion of how Abraham reacted to the Arab custom of paying a tithe, the spoils of war, to the local priest king. While living under pagan rulers, he obeyed pagan customs. So, Abram did according to what Dr. Kelly said Jacob should not do, according to Dr. Kelly. Thus, by Jacob giving a tithe to one of these pagan king priests, he would be, quote, promoting idolatry, child sacrifices, sex with animals, and worship slash prostitution, end quote. So it seems that Dr. Kelly believes that Abram was obligated to promote these because of some Arab custom, but Jacob was not. Basically, Dr. Kelly states that Jacob's tithe was based on a rash vow and had no real place to give it. He misses the whole point. Jacob's grandfather paid the first tithe in the scriptures, and Jacob probably learned to tithe from him. I don't see it as a rash vow, but as a response to an incredible encounter with God. Dr. Kelly dismisses the tithe of Abram as an old heir custom when a person wins a war. Yet, as we look at the account with Jacob, there was no war that he won. And thus, there's no reason to tithe if it was only an old Arab custom. If Jacob did indeed learn the tithe from Abraham, then why did he use the tithe as a vow? Think of it. Dr. Kelly limits his view on the pre-law tithe to an old Abram custom or rash vow. Yet later on, we will see that the restoration of the tithe in the days of Nehemiah and Hezekiah was proof that the nation of Israel had returned to God. In fact, the Bible states in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. Thus, just as Melchizedek is mentioned twice in the Old Testament, so is the pre-law tithe mentioned twice. Yet both Melchizedek and the tithe go hand in hand. Genesis chapter 28 verses 10 through 22 is the text concerning Jacob and his vow. In verse 12, it states, And he dreamed, and behold, a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. Behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. Now, how many of us have this happen in our dreams? Jesus possibly referenced this dream in John chapter 1, verse 51. And he saith unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter ye shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. In verse 15 it states, And behold, I am with thee, and will keep thee in the places whither thou goest, and will bring thee again into this land. For I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. Now, this is the result of his encounter with God. Verse 18. Jacob rose up early in the morning and took the stone that he had put for his pillars and set it up for a pillar and poured oil upon the top of it. This is the first mention of oil in the Bible. In fact, the first two mentions of oil are with Jacob, both in this chapter and in chapter 35. Thus Jacob anointed the land and set it apart for the use of God. The next time we see oil being used to set apart something, it will be with the tabernacle, also the priesthood, and the offerings. Many years later, the prophet Samuel will anoint Israel's first king. What I found surprising was this. I could not find one reference concerning the use of oil 
to set the promised land apart for the purpose of God. The only thing I did find is that Moses blessed the land in Deuteronomy 26.15. To me, what Jacob did was to anoint this pagan land and set it apart. Sometimes we don't even know how our actions will have an impact on future generations. Just as the tithe of Abram was like the children of Levi paying a tithe to the future Messiah priesthood, the anointing of the stone done by Jacob was set in motion that the tithe from the from the promised land would be a holy tithe. So Jacob anoints and makes a decree that this stone will be set apart for the purpose of God. Though Dr. Kelly points out that this is not the holy land, what he seems to overlook is the fact that Jacob, the father of the children of Israel, made a declaration that this land will be set apart unto God. His act of pouring oil upon the pillar shows the importance of this reference as it pertains to tithing. So not only we're the tithe, meaning the house of God, but life and death are in the power of the tongue, Proverbs 18, 21. And by his decree, the land has been set apart to the Lord. Verse 19, and he called the name of that place Bethel. Notice Jacob called the name of the place Bethel, which means house of God. Now, notice Jacob's vow is basically affirming what God had just said to him. And Jacob vowed a vow saying, if God will be with me and will keep me in the way that I go and will give me bread to eat and bring me to, to put on so that I come again to my father's house in peace. Then shall the Lord be my God, and this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house, and all that thou shalt give me I will surely give the tenth unto thee. This is basically what the Lord said to him in verse 15. Basically, this is not a rash vow because he is repeating the promise that God has said to him and he is making a decree in his words. And God did take note of Jacob's vow. Genesis 31, 13. I am the God of Bethel, which thou anointed the pillar and where thou voweth a vow unto me. Now arise, Get thee out of this land and return unto the land of thy kindred. Notice how much God took seriously Jacob by saying, I am the God of Bethel. Jacob also vowed to tithe, whether he was rich or poor, as long as, long as his needs were provided for. And that's how our attitude should be toward giving, that we would give to God and that God would take care of our needs. Some may be rich, some may be poor, but that is the heart of tithing that we see from Jacob. In Genesis chapter 35, God speaks to Jacob to return to Bethel, the place where he had made his vow to God. There Jacob built an altar unto God. So see, it's not a rash vow, Dr. Kelly, because he not only said something, but there were actions behind his very words. The point is God took his vow seriously. So in no way was this a rash vow since Jacob, after his encounter with God, set it apart by consecrating it with oil. And he even went back there and built an altar. And God also took note of another man's vow. Luke chapter 19 verses 1 through 10 is the story of Zacchaeus. Notice Jesus said after the vow that Zacchaeus became a son of Abraham. So if a vow can lead Zacchaeus to salvation, then how can Jacob, the father of the children of Israel, vow be just a rash vow? Zacchaeus did not anoint anything. He did not build an altar. He simply made a, made a vow. But he did have an awesome encounter with God as Jacob did. Remember, Jacob also anointed a pillar and made a decree that was set in motion from that day forward. One thing Dr. Kelly talks about over and over is that the tithe could only come from the Holy Land. Yet before there was a Holy Land, Abram tithe. Before there was 
the Holy Land, Jacob would set apart the land for the purpose of God by pouring oil on a stone. This story is not just a so-called rash vow, as Dr. Kelly claims, but how we have our part in the very purpose of God. Yet the book of Hebrews, speaking of the, the tithe of Abram that came from pagan lands, was considered by God as if the priests were tithing to Melchizedek. That's what God has cleansed, God has cleansed. Both Abram and Jacob's tithe are a type of the tithe for the New Testament believer. Both of their tithes were a response and not by commandment. Here's another quote. However, although there may have existed a tradition to help the poor, Jacob, like Abraham, was not responding to a command from Jehovah to tithe to a particular ministry of holy service. The former law was yet centuries future. End quote. It was not limited to what was tithe and who. And who was the tithe? The tithe before the law of Moses was different. And that is why the tithe in the New Testament is different. When God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, he did it out of a response of love. And God desires that we can look beyond any commandment to tithe in order that out of love we may respond to tithe. Notice the Apostle Paul and how he dealt with slavery. He did not demand that a slave that came to the Lord by him be set free by its owner, but instead in Philemon 1.14, but I prefer to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but out of your own accord. That's from the ESV version. So it is with our giving. The tithe of Abram spoke of who it was to be given to, while the tithe of Jacob speaks of the place which it is to be given to. Jacob vowed the tithe at Bethel, which means the house of God. What we can say for sure is that his descendants did tithe hundreds of years later. This spot would be be right smack in the middle of the future promised land where his descendants did tithe. Both of these texts seem out of place, just like Melchizedek. I agree that they seem out of place since they would point to a different priesthood that would have a different pattern that would not proceed from the sons of Levi. In the next chapter, we will study the chair passages, as Dr. Kelly likes to call it, concerning tithing.